Hello, this is Claudia Phylos with the Center for Hellenic Studies, and I'm so delighted to be joined here today by Professor Danel Padilla Peralta. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. And thanks to all of our community members who are joining us today and for the viewers who will be watching us live. Uh, I welcome you all. Um, we're so happy we're having this conversation together. If you're interested in joining the live chat, uh, you can find the link to that at hour 25. Um, where you can link through to the YouTube channel and join the live chat there. We do have a community member who will be watching that and uh, can present questions or comments that arise in there. So from time to time, we might take those. But for right now, I just want to um, share a few words uh, about your biography. Um, so I just want to let everyone know you have a very, uh, really inspirational story. It's very exciting, and I encourage everyone to learn more about it. So um, you were undocumented and briefly homeless as a child. Um, you were inspired by your high school teachers to study classics at Princeton University, where you graduated as a salutatorian of your class. Uh, you studied at Oxford and at Stanford, and after two years at Columbia's Society of Fellows, you returned to Princeton as an assistant professor in classics, uh, and you're currently affiliated with the university's program in Latino studies. Your 2015 memoir, Undocumented, A Dominican Boy's Odyssey from Homeless Shelter to the Ivy League, it's available through Penguin, uh, I guess Penguin Press, uh, received an Alex Award from the American Library Association, and you have also written for um, The Guardian, Matter, Vox, and The New York Times. Uh, you are currently working on your second book, which is a study of religious worlds of Roman Republic, which is going to be available through Princeton University Press, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Great, and um, you have some other projects that you're working on, including a co-edited volume on appropriation in Roman culture, uh, some articles on classical reception in the 19th and 20th, 20th century Hispanophone Caribbean, and you're also studying the forms of citizenship, um, both ancient and modern. You know, you are a firm believer in the importance of humanistic learning to the promotion of social justice. You've taught at Columbia's Justice and in Education Initiative and its Freedom and Citizenship Seminar. You're also sitting on the editorial board of the public-facing classics journal Adelon, um, and you have contributed articles on that from uh, on that platform, ranging from the Greco-Roman receptions in hip hop to the interplay between ancient xenophobia and modern anti-immigrant politics. So we're so delighted to have you to join us today. You have such a wide range of knowledge, so many interests, and um, we're just delighted to have this discussion with you. So today we're going to be talking about waste in ancient antiquity, um, and uh, maybe themes about political discourse as well. So can you help us think about why you became interested in this topic and how we could begin to think about it ourselves? Well, first, thank you for the extremely generous introduction, which has uh, captured all of my many scattered interests at the moment. Um, I'm so delighted to be joining all of you. Uh, I became in interested in waste for a number of reasons. Um, so a number of years ago, I rewatched one of the opening scenes of Danny Boyle's Slumdog Millionaire. Uh, and this, this movie has, uh, in one of the opening scenes, uh, uh, an encounter featuring the young Jamal, uh, who's been confined in an outhouse uh, by his brother. And he decides to escape via the only route that's available to him. He dives into a cesspit uh, that's underneath uh, the outhouse. And the takeaway, the intended takeaway from the scene uh, is the iron resolve Jamal will show from that point forward in his life. Uh, this is centered uh, in the narrative of the movie. This is a resolve that will ultimately culminate in his material romantic success. Uh, but I was interested in this scene for a different reason. Uh, it evoked a memory, a memory that had been passed down to me. Uh, when my mother uh, was a little child, uh, she uh, one afternoon while walking in her community, uh, which was on the outskirts of Puerto Plata in the Dominican Republic, uh, fell into a cesspit uh, and uh, barely survived. Um, she was recovered, and, um, but she also fell gravely ill um, with fevers and um, didn't, uh, for a period of time, look as if she would make it. And this memory uh, had been transmitted to me simply in the context of many conversations I've had with my mom over the years, but it had gotten me to thinking about um, shifts in landscapes over time, because now if you go to this community where my mom grew up, uh, there are no cesspits anymore, there are no outhouses anymore. Um, there has been an intensification of urban activity and with it, a displacement of people from um, these formerly extremely unhygienic um, 
uh, settings in which many people in my mom's generation grew up. There's another valence to this, though, uh, and this is the one that has since inspired me to take on this work on waste. Um, so uh, throughout uh, many modern uh, and, and postmodern 21st century contexts, um, the abiding preoccupation with waste, and particularly human waste, has been uh, how to get rid of it, uh, how to move it away from uh, spaces that are inhabited by human beings, uh, how to uh, arrive at uh, and promote and sustain uh, rhythms of cleanliness and hygiene uh, that are viewed uh, as being of necessity structured around the principle of doing away with waste. But if one, as I'm tempted often to do, uh, begins to look uh, to Greek and Roman sources uh, and, and, try to, and tries to retrieve from them uh, a, a method of reflecting on waste, one begins to notice that uh, in Greco-Roman antiquity or antiquities, um, the relationship with waste uh, was very, very ambiguous, was extremely complicated and nuanced in ways that uh, can be even surprising. Uh, so it's been standard, and now I have a few slides, a few images that uh, I can show uh, to situate waste in connection with its expression in art. Uh, this has been a topic uh, that has uh, excited the interest of quite a few folks uh, over uh, the past few decades in particular. Um, so um, in one of the uh, slides I prepared, uh, slide number two, there's um, this uh, two items, two works of art um, that uh, really foreground this interest in aestheticizing waste of uh, Piero Manzoni's Melda de la Tista uh, and Maurizio Catalan's America, which is a golden toilet bowl now on display at the Guggenheim Museum. Um, I know. Yep, just give us one second. We're going to bring this up, okay? Because Sarah's going to share, and I want to share with everybody. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so can you orient us again? So these are two items. Uh, the first uh, is uh, Canned Artist Shit uh, by Piero Manzoni. Uh, uh, and the second uh, is a golden toilet bowl, uh, the handiwork of Maurizio Catelan, uh, with bearing the title America, uh, uh, that is now on display at the Guggenheim Museum. Uh, this commitment to a, a focus on, on art uh, that uh, plays with the fecal uh, has obviously something funny to it, um, something transgressive to it, uh, something provocative and edgy to it. Uh, but I would also argue that what gives this uh, its, its real edge, its potential punch, uh, is the long history of leveraging the fecal and human waste uh, in particular uh, as a means of developing and cultivating forms of political satire. Uh, and this brings us to the next slide. Um, this slide uh, is an image. Uh, it's, a, it's a mural painting that went up uh, on Orchard Street in New York by the street artist Hanksy. Uh, and this representation uh, of our now president-elect uh, is actually implicated in a much deeper history of using the fecal as a form of satire. Uh, this deep history uh, goes back uh, to uh, instances in antiquity in which uh, political leaders uh, were routinely dissed uh, or undermined uh, by uh, reference to their own propensities to uh, uh, produce excrement or by their own sort of visceral elemental um, fecality. Uh, the textbook instance of this is the Emperor Claudius, uh, the subject of Seneca's satire, the apicolocentosis, the pumpkinification. Um, in a very famous moment, uh, Seneca imagines Claudius uh, being on his deathbed uh, and saying his dramatic final words, why may puto con cacao may? Oh, woe is me, I think I shat myself. And this is appropriate, according uh, to uh, Seneca, uh, for someone who in his own life uh, had shat everything up. He had con cacao with omnia. He had befouled everything. Uh, but this tradition, as it emerges in Roman context, in turn has a great deal of antecedents in Greek context. Uh, so already Aristophanes in 5th century Athens is uh, 
uh, doing a lot of work uh, with uh, the fecal uh, and is interested above all else in representing the fecal and the excremental as a site for conversations about the political conversations about not just the leadership of Athens, but what it is that Athenians are doing when they engage in political activity. Mm -hmm. um, there I will transition briefly to mentions of the fecal and Homer. Um, and this is slide number six. Uh, so we'll talk about these uh, texts in particular that I find so suggestive um, for thinking about uh, the fecal. Uh, if we go back even before Aristophanes, um, we have these moments in Homer that are really suggestive, not only because they carry with them uh, this incredible emotional and affective punch, but because this incredible emotional affective punch is rooted in um, the presence of the fecal, the presence of waste. Uh, it's indissociability from uh, the rhythms of human life in this really suggestive ways. So there is this race uh, in Iliad Book 23, a foot race that is held um, as part of the funeral games for Patroclus. And this race uh, pits uh, Ajax against Odysseus. And Ajax looks uh, like he's going to win. Um, and, but at the last minute, uh, he slips on poop. Um, he is and, and loses to Odysseus uh, in this race in this really agonizing way. Right, and, and it goes it goes in his mouth and his nose. Right, I mean, it's right. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that's I mean, and that you get this fantastic line in the Greek uh, that onthon uh, apoptuon. Right, he's spitting up poop. Right, it's coming out uh, of his face. Um, and everyone laughs at Ajax. The Achaeans laugh at him. Uh, this laughter uh, is evocative of another moment of laughter early on in the Iliad, uh, in which the entire uh, Greek community uh, laughs at Odysseus's physical beating uh, of the upstart Thersites. Um, but there are also moments in which this laughter, far from being an occasion from humor, and we should bear in mind that uh, the humor that the Achaeans derive from this uh, is in the end conditional on someone's humiliation, uh, Ajax. Uh, there are moments where the fecal is really tied up with grief, uh, with mourning. Uh, and this is another passage in that uh, same slide. Um, so in uh, book 22 of the Iliad, we uh, get this phrase that is rendered uh, by Richard Lattimore uh, as wallowed in the muck, Priam wallowed in the muck. Uh, but kulindominos katakopron uh, quite literally means rolling around in shit. Uh, Priam is so sorrowful, so struck with pain at the news of his son Hector's death that he physically degrades himself by rolling around in poop. This use of the fecal uh, to connote uh, and evoke uh, these instances of uh, supreme emotional uh, immiseration um, receives a twist in the Odyssey. Um, so when in Odysseus Book 17, uh, we in Odyssey Book 17, we encounter Odysseus um, finally arriving at his home, but in disguise as a beggar. He sees his old dog, uh, and his old dog in this incredible recognition scene uh, begins to weakly wag his tail, uh, and he's sitting on a mound of poop uh, in pole uh, And what I find so emotionally uh, impactful about this scene, uh, which I always think about since I have a dog, um, is uh, how this connection between Odysseus and Argos, uh, which um, is gestured at by the text, Odysseus sees Argos and Argos sees Odysseus, his old master, um, is hammered home by uh, the final evocation of Argos a few lines later. Uh, he's going to pass away uh, on this mound. Uh, his sight of Odysseus is the last sight in his life. Uh, but what I found myself asking as I revisited the scene and I thought about my own sort of emotional response to it uh, was why is there this large mound of poop 
uh, in front uh, of Odysseus's old house in the first place? Um, the answer is actually one that's provided um, by the Homeric poet uh, uh, himself uh, in uh, those same lines. Uh, this uh, poop has been gathered up um, for uh, the household servants of Odysseus to use uh, as manure, to manure uh, the farms. Uh, so the way this works is that uh, all of this manure uh, that has been uh, collected in the household of Odysseus is now going to be taken out um, and distributed across the countryside in order to fertilize the fields. Uh, this is a purposeful use of waste, uh, the use of waste as manure, uh, that has far-reaching implications, not only for our interpretation of uh, Argos as sitting on this mound in the final moments of his life, but for uh, decoding uh, the rhythms of agricultural practice in antiquity, uh, because it turns out uh, that so much of the organization of the Greek countryside, not only in this mythic legendary period of the Iliad and Odyssey, but in fact, uh, in the historical and archaeological record uh, as documented by a whole range of testimonia, uh, both material and non-material, is predicated on the rhythms of manuring and on the continuous use and reuse of waste, human and animal, uh, to make farms productive. Uh, so I figure I should stop there uh, because uh, otherwise I will get carried away and, and tell you everything uh, you need to know about manure. Uh, but the point on which I wanted to end was just the need to um, potentially re-experience uh, the encounter with waste in antiquity as implicated in these circuits, not just of, of affect or sentimentality, which uh, after all is the message of these incidents in Homer, uh, but circuits of production, of economic vitality, um, and uh, in time of commerce, since we have later sources that tell us uh, that certain kinds of manure were actually sold as commodities uh, on the international Mediterranean market. Uh, so I will just end it there and uh, open it up to discussion, which will be fun. Well, wow, thanks. Okay, so Danelle, you, so you've raised several points for us. So we're thinking about, in particular, sort of the emotional response. Um, we're thinking about art, you know, this theme in terms of artistic and political discourse, uh, and we're also thinking about, you know, production and economic ramifications. So these are just three places to begin. Uh, any of those are fair game at this point. Anyone have any comments or questions so far? What do you think about these passages? So it'll take a second for people to unmute their microphone. Uh, so I see Sarah, please. Sorry, and introduce yourself. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, um, I'm Sarah, and I, I'm I'm in Scotland, uh, and I, I was very interested because when I'd been reading the passages beforehand, uh, in that contrast between the humour and the deeply emotional and moving scenes with uh, Argos and Priam. You know, that, I mean, both of those passages make me cry every time I read them. Um, and I, I, I'm glad you've answered the question about why was this pile of dung actually in the courtyard? Because it seems very close to human habitation. Um, but I, I had also been thinking, uh, I, I hadn't thought necessarily in terms of commercial use, but um, we've been thinking very much about how ancient Greek heroes are connected uh, with the fertility of the land and of crops and uh, um, of orchards and so on and so forth and I had wondered whether there was a connection um, between the, these heroes uh, mm -hmm. including Argos and Priam uh, and with that with that fertility of the fields um, associated specifically with heroes yeah I, I am in full agreement that this is an association that's being activated by um, what may seem to be this uh, uh, passing or um, incidental reference to manure. Um, in the case of uh, Prime's grieving and in the case of um, the uh, dung gathered in the courtyard of Odysseus's home, uh, we see both an emphasis on proper uh, social practice. So in the case of Priam, Priam grieves in accordance with how people are expected to grieve. And an emphasis on the degree to which social practice um, as constituted in this community uh, interfaces with uh, the rhythms of everyday life. I mean, there is uh, at one level uh, this uh, insistence on the fact that, well, um, 
even at these moments of, of truly heart-rending grief, um, the essential patterns of life uh, continue, right? Uh, there is still manoring that has to take place and that needs to be done. But I, I would suggest that this distinction between uh, the expression of sentiment on one level and its formalization uh, in the epic uh, through these gestures, and then these practices that point to uh, the, the deep embeddedness uh, within uh, various forms of agricultural or agrarian practice, um, characteristic of the society in which the heroes live or in which the heroes are imagined to live, uh, are actually two sides of the same coin. I mean, we have other moments in the Iliad, notably in the shield exorcist, um, that bring out this point so clearly. All of these different behaviors of the heroes are uh, interconnected with these manifold strands of social uh, and cultural life. Uh, and what gives um, them their special salience is the degree to which uh, we understand their actions uh, as capable of recreating before our eyes through the work um, of the epic poet, uh, all of the many splendid activities that are taking place in the background, that are taking place beneath the surface, um, a surface upon which these heroes' lives glide, uh, but um, a surface that is pretty vividly imagined by uh, the use of poop. Uh, and one of these essential uh, concerns of these communities that live and breathe uh, in these epics is precisely with fertility. Um, and here the heroes in their close proximity to dung, and not just to dung, but of course the beings that are producing the dung, since in the case of uh, the Ajax Odysseus foot race, we learn that Ajax uh, had slipped on the dung of all of these oxen that had been gathered up by Achilles for sacrifice. We see also the prospect of this incredible entanglement between the human and the animal, uh, the, the floral and the faunal, um, that uh, might press against any effort to differentiate cleanly between the heroes themselves and the habitats and ecologies in which they reside. Mm. I'm so glad that you mentioned that detail about where the dung came from that Ajax slips on because that's such a fascinating detail to include, right? It, it just makes everything so interconnected. Um, and But I'm wondering if you could comment on something else about waste in ancient antiquity. I mean, one of the words that we've talked about in our community so far um, is the idea of miasma. So this is sort of a key, one of the key terms that our community has um, has thought about. And so I guess I'm wondering, um, you know, it, within modern culture, we think about waste as something that is um, polluted, right? It's pollution, maybe. So, but I'm not sure that I'm getting the sense that we have that same sense of pollution um, in the ancient world. Can you talk a bit about that? So we know that starting um, in, in classical Athens, but in all likelihood with precedents that reach back before um, the 5th century BC, uh, we uh, see evidence for uh, people who are tasked with uh, picking up and, and removing dung. Uh, and even though our evidence for them is a little um, uh, exiguous, uh, we know that uh, this is not uh, a, a, a profession of high repute, right? Um, these, these folks are um, on the social margins. We know that by the time we get um, to the Roman world, those who are tasked uh, with uh, the cleanup of dung um, are uh, constituted in some domains as being impure. Uh, but at the same time, we also know that um, someone has to do this stuff uh, and that because this stuff has to be done, it is flagged as important and vital, and that therefore even those people who might be viewed as polluted, um, as dirty, uh, because they're regularly handling dung, are also in some fundamental sense indispensable. Uh, and this is implicated in, in, I think, sort of larger questions uh, that, um, I th receive added emphasis in connection with um, discussions about uh, economies of uh, waste scavengers and manure removals, uh, removers in parts of the modern world. Um, I'm thinking in particular uh, of the degree to which the cleanup uh, of dung uh, has been 
uh, deployed as a technology for the reinforcement of caste distinctions in modern India, uh, specifically in the uh, oppression, continued oppression of Dalits. Uh, but at the same time, uh, in antiquity, uh, we see this incredibly ambiguous and fraught relationship um, between uh, those entities uh, and those people who prided themselves uh, on certain forms of physical purity uh, that involved other, in, among other things, being separated from uh, things like dung, and at the same time, the proximity of uh, producers of dung uh, and the need for those uh, uh, removers of dung, I mean, to be continuously involved, even in the operations of the sacred. Uh, we have a fragment from a, a Roman source that tells us uh, about uh, a, a sacerdotula, a, a, a priestess um, who uh, produced, who makes uh, waste in a temple of, of Mars, uh, about which we're otherwise ill-informed. Um, and there's been some debate about the exact interpretation of this uh, fragment. Uh, is it that uh, the fragment preserves a line from an inscription that dictates that priests and priestesses not engage in relieving themselves in this uh, little uh, shrine to Mars? Or is it that what we're actually seeing uh, is a, a set of guidelines for um, how priests and priestesses should take care of their own bodily needs in areas that need to be uh, policed as sacred and need to be maintained as sacred qua pure? We don't know this. Uh, we don't know uh, precisely what the set of circumstances were around this priestess and this text, um, but it's useful to keep in mind that distinctions between the sacred and pure on the one hand uh, and the uh, impure on the other hand uh, are porous in all kinds of revealing ways in antiquity. Wow, okay, so that's, um, I think that's really helping us think about the way that these topics can even um, affect space, right? Uh, understandings about space, uh, sacred, what's sacred and what's not, uh, and about how it's helping to define these spaces. Um, okay, anyone, next next question or comment? Yeah, Laura, please introduce yourself. Oh, uh oh, I think Laura um, got disconnected and said she was trying to ask a question. Um, so uh, Olga, I think, has a comment. Olga, do you want to share that? Well, yes, I, I wrote in the chat. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, what, yes, what Padilla is <laughs> saying reminded me of this maxim, but it's a scientific maxim. Mm -hmm. So nothing is really dirty or clean or sacred. Everything is, uh, is ch subject to change and uh, will be transformed. That's why manure, as he was saying, uh, will bring new life, life for us. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I love that line. I, I love uh, your evocation of that principle uh, because there has been, uh, over the past few decades, a lot of work uh, done uh, initially among anthropologists and then extending to some classicists who engaged with anthropologists uh, in demarcating uh, forms and sites of purity and impurity in, in the ancient world, especially um, as uh, these types of impurity um, were rooted in uh, or um, reflected the outcomes of um, handling specific kinds of, product, of products, especially, uh, but not only, um, bodily emissions, right? Uh, so folks like Mary Douglas um, and then following uh, in, in uh, her lead, um, scholars of Roman religion, of Greek religion, um, had uh, paid a lot of attention uh, to uh, the kinds of things uh, that could make one impure and that necessitated various forms of ritual cleansing. But the paradox uh, with uh, these items that could confer impurity, uh, including uh, not only, say, dung uh, or urine, um, but uh, say, for example, uh, menstrual blood, which receives a lot of attention in many different Mediterranean and your Eastern protocols of purity, is that at the same time that these are viewed as constitutive of impurity, they can also be, and they are in fact put to 
very effective use uh, in the lives of communities. Uh, and in the case of dung, uh, we, we know obviously the degree to which um, uh, manure becomes indispensable to the, the daily, semi-annual, annual rhythms of agrarian communities in uh, the Greek and Roman worlds for many, many, many centuries. Uh, in fact, uh, our reliance on, on dung and on manure uh, continues well into the early modern and modern period um, and precipitates, in the case uh, of a series of well-known incidents from the 19th century, imperialist projects that are, rely, that are motivated by the burning desire to acquire guano, which is pigeon manure, uh, for uh, use, uh, nitrogen-rich pigeon manure. Um, this is what uh, propels the guano imperialism of the 1800s. Wow, uh, well, okay. I, I, this is, yeah, the guano imperialism. We can talk wow. about guano imperialism. Uh -huh. um, but uh, at the same time, we also have um, other bodily emissions that are, despite their seeming impurity, um, being purposed to effective use uh, in contexts that are not manure specific. So um, I'll, I'll simply leave you with this one uh, little tidbit um, from antiquity, um, by the time uh, we get to Pliny the Elder, uh, who's writing in the first century C, uh, we have all of these recipes uh, for medical treatments uh, that involve the use of manure. Hmm. Uh, so in Pliny the Elder, in book 28 of the natural history, we have scores of medical or pseudo-medical treatments that feature uh, the use of dung, the use of urine, uh, and in several cases, the use of menstrual blood. Uh, and this is remarkably important for our understanding of the rhythms of ancient medicine. It's also really significant for our understanding uh, of purity and impurity practices in the ancient world. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so now I want to invite Laura, who I know had a comment or question previously. Laura, do you want to share that? And then I think we have a comment from Janet. Yeah. Going back to Argos for uh, a minute, um, you mentioned that you were a dog owner, and I am. And it just Can't hear. always has occurred to me as a little bit strange. Hold on, Laura, you know what? We're having trouble hearing you. Um, can you move a little bit closer to the microphone? Yeah. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, okay. Um, it always occurred to me as strange that uh, interpret, interpreters have regarded this passage as showing uh, how Argos, how miserable uh, and pitiful uh, mm -hmm. he is. But dogs love to roll in dung. <laughs> mine, mine do. And uh, I think it, it's, it's um, if Homer were a dog owner, or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people debate about whether he really understood war and whether he really understood this or that. But if he really understood dogs, uh, I think it would be kind of strange that he chose rolling in a pile of dung as uh, an exemplar of, of misery. What do you think of that? Oh, I, 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 I love that moment because it, again, confirms something that uh, I guess we could all get behind, which is that the Homeric poet has uh, an exceptional attention to these details of these these very similistic details uh, about uh, home and family life in the communities whose worlds are being recreated in the epics. Uh, but I also agree with you that um, it's not enough to read the incident involving Argos as evocative of misery, although we have obviously the passage um, featuring Priam's expression of grief in the Iliad that can be neatly indexed to this. Uh, for any of us who own dogs, as you say, it is quite uh, uh, a regular sight to see them rolling in all kinds of things, including on occasion their own dung. Uh, or uh, in the case of uh, my dog occasionally, uh, a bird poop. Uh, and it's, it's again this attention to detail uh, in recreating a scene that that reverberates with me. Uh, but it's also a reminder of the degree to which um, humans and animals alike uh, cannot escape the excremental uh, in this world uh, that's being imagined by the Homeric poet. Uh, it is proximate, it is immediate, uh, it is there. 
uh, for dogs to roll in uh, and for humans themselves to roll in uh, in Prime's way. Um, the juxtaposition of the Prime scene and the Argos scene uh, also, I think, raises a question uh, to which I have no uh, certain answer of the degree to which um, the lines between the human and animal are blurred in moments of grief, right? Um, and there's a, a, a tendency to um, read this uh, moment of grief on Prime's part um, as involving uh, a kind of, let's say, degradation, right? I mean, look at how he's debasing himself. Uh, he's uh, leaping into this 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 uh, uh, pile of uh, this gathered up pile of poop and rolling in it. Uh, but there's another, not necessarily mutually exclusive way of reading it that would take it uh, as a sign of the degree to which uh, the fecal operates as a as a medium, uh, as a material for transition between certain states and other states, and that this mode of transition is common to human and animals alike. Um, it is a way through which uh, sentiments that extend beyond humans to encompass the animal, non-human as well, get to be expressed and activated in the poem. Wow, that is gorgeous. So, uh, or, Laura, please, did you have a follow-up? I was just going to say uh, another aspect of that passage is the fact that uh, Argos was no longer the hunting dog that he used uh, to be. Uh -huh. I kind of think of if he's retired from his duties of hunting and if he is in fact enjoying rolling in the dung, uh, that would give you a very different view of Argos. That was just what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Lord, you know, that really makes me think of the brooch um, or the pin. Were you going to talk about this? Sit down, please. No, 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 you go for it. I'd love to, yeah. Well, no, just the way that you're making us, uh, Laura's, uh, prompt made me make, think about this connection, which is that one of the things that helps to identify Odysseus is his description of the pin or brooch that Penelope had given to him. And on it is a, is a scene of a dog uh, hunting uh, a deer. I can't quite remember the detail, mm -hmm. right? Is that it? Mm -hmm. um, and so, and also if we see the scene where Odysseus shows up at the swineherd's place right away, he's approached by dogs. So there's something very interesting happening with dogs there. So I think you're right that we should be thinking about the significance between Argos at that moment and those other dogs at those other pivotal moments or mythical moments. But Danelle, please, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Oh, no, I, 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 I'm grateful to you for bringing that up because it's, for starters, uh, evocative of the degree to which there's this uh, play with Odysseus as a hunter, right? Uh, so uh, Odysseus, uh, in the moment uh, when he is being bathed uh, by uh, his old nurse, um, we, as the readers, get taken back uh, to a moment in time in Odysseus's childhood um, where he will, in the course of hunting, uh, be severely injured, right? And the resulting scar is going to be um, the, the key signifier that reveals to the nurse who replay his identity. Uh, but hunting at the same time that uh, it's connected to Odysseus's past uh, is also con connected to his immediate and near future, since he will be doing hunting of his own with the suitors uh, in a few books. Uh, and conversely, Argos's displacement from the hunt, his retirement from the hunt, uh, is uh, evocative of uh, what happens when uh, one arrives at old age and can no longer continue hunting anymore. Uh, and here, I think the juxtaposition between Argos and, and Priam brings out something really beautiful, uh, which is that Argos is a really old dog. He is an old man in some respects. He's an old being, much like Priam is um, in the Iliad. Um, if uh, we trust the Homeric poet, uh, Argos must be uh, in, in, in his 20s or something like that by the time Odysseus uh, <laughs> right. gets back. Uh, he Odysseus leaves him behind as a as a, as a pup uh, and comes back uh, to see him all aged, uh, and it is this ability through the intermediating power um, uh, of uh, insinuation and evocation to signal uh, both Odysseus's current responsibilities as, as someone who will be hunting suitors and his future as someone who will grow old uh, uh, and and eventually. 
uh, die, although we don't uh, know uh, that he died on a pile of dung. He will die, uh, as we are told in the Tiresias prophecy, far. Uh, 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 he, will, he will die um, having gone on this journey uh, to, to spread knowledge of the ore uh, to other people. Uh, but the important and essential similarity uh, brought to the fore by Odysseus's own emotional encounter with this dog sitting on a pile of manure uh, and Priam's uh, encounter with manure uh, is the interlocking significance of age uh, on the one hand and responsibility on the other hand. Uh, since the manure that we were talking about in connection with Argos is the site for an exercise of a different kind of responsibility, namely the responsibility of those household servants uh, who are charged with keeping Odysseus's farmstead up and running, even after their own home has been taken over by these suitors, which adds another layer of complication to the entire mm -hmm. uh, setup. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, at this point, uh, Daniel, I'm hoping we could have your thoughts on a few comments that have come in through the, um, through the YouTube chat. Mm -hmm. So here is one. Um, it's by Cecilia Tiana, I think. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Fascinating uh, talk. Thank you. Um, she's joining us from Canada, and she wants to know, did you find a discursive difference between waste that is connected to fertility and prosperity and waste that brings about infertility and hardship? Mm -hmm. So there is a distinction um, that one could plot uh, that would segregate uh, waste uh, that is productive and generative of, of agricultural fertility um, and waste uh, that brings about infertility. Uh, one of the ways of plotting this is uh, to look at uh, how different kinds of bodily effluvia, um, and again, I'll, I'll bring into play uh, Pliny the Elder's references uh, to menstrual blood as well uh, as references to the use of menstrual blood. Uh, in uh, other authorities, notably the Hippocratic um, uh, authorities. Um, these references um, make considerable play uh, with menstrual blood, especially in the case of Pliny's write-up of this, uh, as something that could potentially uh, wreak devastation on farms. Um, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, we have one reference in Book 28 of Pliny the Elder to the prospect uh, of menstrual blood is, is actually being capable uh, of, of killing crops. Uh, so we have certain emissions from the body uh, that are indexed according to their capacity, not only to bring prosperity in the case of manure, but potentially also uh, to inflict infertility um, and uh, cause hardship for communities. Uh, and this kind of tension is one that um, does get some play in our uh, literary sources um, for the Dis differentiated uses of waste. Hmm. So, you know, one of the things I'm wondering about is, um, you know, are we seeing this in uh, in comedy, for instance? You know, right now we've been thinking about epic, but have you found these same themes in comedy, or is this handled differently there? Uh, so the, the handling in comedy, especially Aristophanic comedy, is, is a little different, uh, but um, it's not uh, radically different. Uh, so there's before we get to the advent of comedy itself, we have uh, the rise of Greek satire to contend with. Um, there is uh, this very curious fragment um, from uh, the satirist Hipponax, uh, fragment 92 West. Uh, and there's a ritual that involves a Lydian woman. Um, uh, and at some point in this ritual, um, everything gets spattered with crap. Uh, uh, with poop. I mean, this is the, the, the Greek phrase. And all these dung beetles come out of nowhere, more than 50 of them, according to the poet. Um, we don't know much about the ritual, but when we get to, to comedy, uh, we have in Aristophanes' Cox piece uh, a comedy that features this voracious dung beetle, uh, it's the possession of this guy, Trigaeus. Uh, and the, the dung beetle is set out to uh, signify an entire range of social relations. Um, among other things, um, one of the purposes of this comedy appears uh, to be to, to foreground quite explicitly uh, how certain members of the Athenian community are so voracious as to literally be willing to eat shit. Uh, uh, this is the degree to which uh, they are so intent uh, on um, practicing these forms of social domination that are being mocked in Aristophanes' comedy. 
Uh, and in comedy, both with Aristophanes and then much later uh, in the uh, text from Seneca that I alluded to, uh, you get this remarkably sharpened uh, and, and very deft attention um, to the many potential humoristic significations of poop. Um, this will then get picked up much later on, uh, after Seneca himself, uh, in the rise of Christian homiletics that feature, uh, in the case of John Chrysostom, uh, a very dogged emphasis on scat talk as a means of invective. I mean, we get uh, these uh, moments in the homilies in which people are castigated for wallowing around uh, in shit. Um, they are accused of um, uh, having debased themselves um, in these sewer ditches, um, uh, as the Greek tells us in the homilies. So we get these phase changes in how waste uh, is manipulated, not only in comedy, but in fact across a whole range of genres all the time. Mm -hmm. And so it's part of this, uh, you know, really strong artistic message, which brings me to a comment uh, by another one of our YouTube uh, contributors, um, Jorge Luis, is, asked, uh, is noting that last week I visited, I'm so sorry, I hope I'm going to say this, Lope de Vegas uh, Museum House in Madrid and found out that at the time wastes were thrown out to the street a few meters away from the poet's desk. Um, so, so that kind of proximity uh, it is interesting here. I'm thinking about that um, and thinking about the way that um, this, uh, the excrement itself, right, becomes inspiration, becomes uh, a medium of expression, um, kind of all these things. Professor Olga, uh, Olga I think, also has a, another comment or question. Do you want to share that, Olga? So, thank you. Well, I, I wrote, uh, is, is again, when um, I, the same maxim, nothing is lost, nothing is created, everything is transformed, which is attributed to a French scientist. But I think it might have its origins in Greek thought. And, but I don't know who. I imagine in Democritus. I really don't know. Yeah, I have to. I have to chase this down. I'll make a note to myself to see if the if the maxim because there's a, a a sort of Heraclitian shading to it as well. Mm -hmm. um, but let me track that down. Thank you for that. Um, it would be interesting to know. Um, and here, uh, I can indulge in a bit more informed uh, speculation. Um, how uh, this this movement uh, that that culminates in. Uh, a series of, uh, of scientific and philosophical um, uh, discourses, the, the movement of the pre-Socratic philosophers uh, uh, makes sense of or grapples with waste. Because you have several um, pre-Socratic philosophers who are interested um, in establishing what um, the sort of the base matter of, of the universe is, and, and very famously, um, uh, one of them will insist that it's water, uh, water is the source of everything, um, whereas others uh, will attempt to demarcate between different categories of substances, uh, will um, speak not only of water and of fire, but will also speak of dirt. Um, and so thinking about uh, the degree to which uh, philosophy and scientific projects um, begin to make sense of the presence of waste um, is really significant and important. I'll know um, that, uh, and this uh, goes back to the Homeric passages we were talking about earlier, uh, when we get to Plato, uh, we get this remarkable uh, discussion uh, in the Republic. Uh, so Socrates, uh, <clears throat> as represented in the Republic, has some issues with Homer's uh, uh, play with waste. Um, and so we learn um, uh, from uh, Socrates' pretty sort of heated um, uh, engagement with his interlocutors in the Republic about this, um, that Socrates uh, w wants his interlocutors uh, to enlist, uh, to, to join him in this project of petitioning Homer and the other poets, not to represent heroes 
uh, in morning, or, and here's the uh, signature passage, Priam spinning around in feces, right? Um, so some philosophers, obviously, um, here we have Plato representing Socrates as being one of them, um, will take these kinds of scenes that represent uh, human beings wallowing in uh, filth. Uh, as ignoble, as lacking in the appropriate ethical uplift. Um, and there are other ways of dealing with this, um, uh, in addition to simply developing a critique from the philosophical side. Uh, one could simply choose uh, to rewrite or reimagine these Homeric moments um, that have such a, a sentimental and affective pedigree uh, without uh, there being any waste or fecal component to it at all. Uh, so we have this scene in Virgil uh, in which uh, we have a foot race um, and one of the characters in that foot race while racing uh, slips. Uh, the scene is structured to evoke the Ajax and Odysseus foot race, um, but crucially uh, he doesn't slip uh, on poop. Uh, this character slips on blood. Uh, this is the blood uh, of those sacrificed uh, oxen, um, oxen that have been sacrificed for reasons similar to uh, those that lay behind the sacrifice uh, noted as preceding the foot race uh, in the Iliad. Uh, and we then, in later times, will see still more of this, since very famously, uh, when uh, translating the Iliad, uh, Alexander Pope uh, will see to it uh, that the fecal doesn't come up at all. If you look at Alexander the Pope's translation, you will see that there is not a hint of the fecal uh, in these moments that we've been attending to. Um, okay, so I think um, Helen has a quick question or comment, but she can't ask it. There's too much noise in her background, so I'm going to respond. She's asking, the passage when Ajax falls into the waist during the race, uh, the Achaeans are laughing, is it used as an amusing way to ease tension? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, this is about a, a comedic moment, right? Mm -hmm. No, I'm fully in agreement that this is a comedic moment. Um, and But I, as I, I think the question also um, implies, uh, the moment nods to another series of moments uh, that occur outside of the Iliad, but that uh, are anticipated uh, in the Iliad. Uh, and this is the tension between uh, Ajax and Odysseus that will ultimately result uh, in Ajax committing suicide. Uh, and so already in the Iliad, uh, we see in the foot race and in moments before the foot race, I mean, of course, Ajax's uh, efforts uh, um, in, from books 11 on uh, to distinguish himself um, in the battle against the Trojans as they uh, assail uh, the Achaean camp, uh, we see Ajax and Odysseus pitted against each other uh, in ways that will um, that are, are clearly meant to evoke uh, the tension um, that will be taken up beyond the Iliad in the mythic uh, tradition and that will uh, center their encounter, uh, their fight over uh, the arms uh, of Achilles. Uh, as being instrumental in guiding one of the heroes in one way towards his self-destruction and the other uh, to uh, a, a position of distinction uh, that will then be dramatically undermined by his incredible ordeal to get back home, right? Um, so in different ways, we have this scene playing up uh, the possibility of drawing humor from uh, uh, this this moment of intense competition gone uh, somewhat wrong. Uh, at the same time, the scene uh, also, I think, darkly insinuates the prospect of explosive rivalry, uh, and that's what makes it all the more potent. So Helen's saying thank you. Um, oh, Helen, do you please do you have a follow up? Uh, she doesn't have follow-up. So I guess I'm just, I'm thinking about these scenes that you're helping us think about in which, you know, the hero is stumbling, the hero is falling in, in, in poop in some cases, in blood, in the passage from Virgil. Um, I mean, uh, it's fascinating to me that we have these substances that you're helping us think about at these crucial heroic moment where the hero fails, right? Mm -hmm. um, and about how these, these uh, substances may be a marker in some sense. And then that makes me think about the way that um, for Ajax, sort of the, the dung gets in his nose, it gets in his mouth. And for me, that 
excuse me, sorry. For me, that really helps me understand. Um, I'm thinking about the way that the uh, the hero when he becomes immortalized. Uh, we have that scene in the Iliad uh, where the body of Patroclus is taken by Achilles' mother and she trickles um, ambrosia down his nose, right? So for me, that moment is sort of a, an anti-immortalization. And so the way that you have talked about it has really helped me understand um, maybe these substances in terms of what you talk about, sort of about like transitioning, uh, moments of transition for the hero, and then also um, um, just uh, affecting their status. Mm -hmm. No, and I, I think it's uh, really clarifying uh, to think about uh, the treatment of, of the human body and of human corpses um, with uh, an eye to um, the fecal and the excremental, um, because uh, we have the you know this handling of say the body of Patroclus or um, the body of Hector, um, and there uh, is this concern obviously with ensuring that uh, the bodies uh, are not uh, befouled. Even though in the case uh, of Achilles, um, uh, Achilles will make sure or will attempt uh, to make sure uh, that Hector's body is subjected to the most violent forms of degradation possible, and yet we learn. Uh, that the body is preserved intact and unrotting. Uh, the rotting side uh, is not the only side of corruption, of physical corruption and befoulement, though. Um, and this is where I think one should be thinking more carefully about um, this passage in which Priam uh, rolls around in dung. Um, what else? Uh, what is happening with Hector's body as it's being dragged uh, through this battlefield and then on the way uh, to the Achaean camp. It will also be rolling through dirt and dung. Uh, there's going to be lots of dung on the battlefield, lots of dung of dead people uh, on the battlefield. Uh, and so to recover these images uh, is to, uh, and to recover this landscape of the excremental is to arrive, I think, at a more uh, textured sense uh, of what precisely is at stake in the handling of bodies as they transition from life to death um, and as they uh, are either accorded uh, the treatment that they deserve or conversely are doled out uh, this uh, unethical treatment that becomes a focus for preoccupation and negotiation in the Homeric epics themselves. Mm -hmm. Janet, I think, has a comment or question. Uh, this is Jen from New York. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I didn't uh, compose a question right, but I, wa I was thinking about public bathrooms in Rome. And this is a place, this is a shared experience. Is, is it like, um, would you consider that, oh, let's have a talk uh, by the water fountain and people come and talk and other interactions happen through this experience. Mm -hmm. Do you, did you see anything uh, coming out of this experience from the public bathrooms? Mm -hmm. No, I've been thinking a lot about public bathrooms. Um, and uh, in particular, I have uh, found it useful to think with uh, this uh, excavated uh, Ostian uh, tavern of the seven sages. So uh, this is a, what, was initially believed to have been a tavern, but which is now being considered to have been a latrine, a public latrine, uh, recovered in Ostia, uh, in, uh, not far from Rome. And it dates to about 100 CE or so. Uh, there are all these philosophical figures who are painted on the walls. And next to these philosophical figures are, are little tituli, little inscriptions uh, uh, that have been painted on and they feature advice. And so the one uh, you see here, um, thanks for the slide, um, uh, is the advice uh, credited to Solon the Athenian, the Athenaios. Uh, and this advice uh, is uh, reported as Udbene Kakarat Wentrem Palpawit Solon. Solon rubbed his tummy uh, that he may that he might poop better. Uh, to poop better. Right? It's good advice, massage your tummy, you'll have a nice bowel movement. Uh, this is great. Um, and 
there is another figure uh, we see also on this wall. This is the, the philosopher Thales, the great uh, pre-Socratic, um, and he's represented as giving uh, advice uh, to uh, those who are, are struggling um, uh, to discharge their vow murum. Duhum kakantes vonwit ut nitant. He advised uh, those who were struggling to defecate uh, to try harder. Uh, and so this kind of play with the, the, the philosophical uh, on the one hand um, and uh, the uh, gastric on the other hand um, can be read in one of several ways. So one convention for reading it is to take it as you know, just kind of funny. This is transgressive in some ways. Look at uh, these philosophers who are being lampooned by having these bits uh, of gastric wisdom credited to them. Um, but my take is that we should be very sensitive uh, to the, the degree to which bowel concerns are actually a really, really serious part um, of life in the ancient world. After all, the ancient Greco-Roman world is one in which we have regular reports in our sources, in our literary sources, uh, and plenty of circumstantial evidence um, from beyond the literary material of people suffering from crippling and ultimately fatal uh, uh, gastric diseases. Uh, and so pooping is a big deal. Uh, and as the medical corpus tells us, uh, being able uh, to regularly evacuate oneself is a pretty significant uh, concern, one that is uh, registered by medical writings and by doctors who are monitoring their patients in antiquity. Uh, so this advice, while very playful, uh, is also advice that should be taken for what it is, uh, a, a measure of the extent to which the dialogue in a seemingly sort of public uh, restroom uh, is tied into these broader circuits of concern about the rhythms and movements of the body. Danielle, uh, you know, this has been so fun. I just realized we've gone over time, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So uh, it, it's unbelievable that we've gone from Homer to uh, the graffiti, the philosophical, the philosophical graffiti in um, the public Roman latrines. But I think we do need to sign off for now. I hope we could continue this conversation maybe in our discussion boards at Hour 25. If our community members post some questions, can we follow up with you? Yes, absolutely. Oh, thank you so much. So uh, we really appreciate your helping us to think about this topic that um, is both very practical and immediate and every day. Uh, it's a political, uh, it's a political theme. It's an artistic um, inspiration or a means of expression. So uh, you've given us a lot to think about and, and to continue talking about. Thank you so much to you for joining us. Uh, and thank you again to all our community members who joined us and to those who are viewing us online, especially the people who posted their comments and questions. Uh, and we look forward to our next open house discussion. Take great care. All right. Thank you all. Thank you so much.